Hey folks, Rich from Trapping Inc. TV here. And we all have our idea of the perfect morning. You know what I'm talking about. For me, the perfect morning starts with the aroma and flavor of freshly brewed Old Smokes coffee. Studies have shown that just the smell of fresh coffee can boost brain activity. No kidding. Well, that's certainly no secret to me. I can barely talk before that first cup. <laughs> just ask Sandy. I'm a dark roast man, and Old Smokes Coffee's darkest roast, Stout Maple, is what gets my day in gear. Extra dark, it's strong, aromatic, and smooth. It gets me revved up for whatever that day throws at me. Old Smokes roast their coffee over wood fires, the old-fashioned way. Wood roasting takes more time, much longer than modern hot air roasting. Slow roasting over wood takes the bitter out of the bean and imparts a heavenly taste and aroma from the wood smoke. Old Smokes makes a roast perfect for each person. There are five roasts, from light to extra dark, each roasted over a different wood for a unique flavor. Did you know the darker the roast, the lower the caffeine content? It's true. Caffeine is a volatile oil that evaporates with roasting. The lightest roast has the most caffeine, and the darkest roasts have the most flavor. Right now, you can order from their online store and use our promo code RICH. That's R-I-C-H and get 10% off your entire order. Pretty simple. Just go to www.oldsmokescoffee.com, that's O-L-E smokescoffee.com, and use the promo code RICH. That is promo code RICH for 10% off your entire order. And now let's get to today's show. To get back to the, to the style of cabin, why does that figure into the story? Was it? It figures into the story uh, only because the vast majority of, of books uh, and publications uh, written, um, and, and once again, this is, this is kind of my, my, my pet peeve or, or my gripe or whatever, they're, they're um, suggesting that he deliberately built the cabin to be able to withstand a siege. Oh, okay, I'm getting it now. You're... you're... <laughs> They're, they're saying he would never, that no trappers did that. Just right. just some person angry at the world that wanted to fight would do it. Right. Ah, uh, yes. okay. Yes, yes. The, see, very first, the very first books that I read uh, uh, on this, they indicated, you know, that it was deliberately built that way so that he could be below ground level and fire out at, at the police without, without being able to, without having to be hit by bullets. And, and this is, you know, over, over the course of, of 30, 40 years, Rich, this is kind of what got me more and more peeved when I read, you know, books like Child of the Wilderness and, and whatnot, and they and articulated, no, this is, this is the standard of how cabins were built, yep. uh, unless you were in an ideal location with the materials and knew that you were going to be there for, for a number of seasons. Even Saudis were often like uh, around here. The Saudis were often dug in. I mean, your the very first sod that you that you used was right what, what used to be your floor, you yeah. know. And I mean, they were they were they were all dug down, and it was just because of of the fact that you know that's that's the easiest stuff you'll ever heat, right? Yeah. So yeah. they get into a, a, a gunfight. Does this is this pr protracted? Does it last long? Uh, yeah, it goes on for, so this, this goes on for days. Um, they're shooting back and forth. They finally determine that what they got to do is dynamite them out of there. Okay, uh, it was kind of lucky that they brought dynamite then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the unfortunate thing, though, is in the extreme cold, the dynamite was frozen and not working so well. So, yeah. um number of different things. They talk about the, the team members thawing the dynamite by putting it underneath their clothes next to their body to thaw it out. Um, and they would light a stick, um, get us, you know, sprint as close as they could to the cabin, chuck it, and um, it's, it's not working. None of this is, uh, is, is having any effect. Sunday, January 10th, one of the fellows that's with them, who's listed as a trapper, uh, Newt Lang, um, who I have pictures of, Newt Lang was a trapper, and I believe later on in years it became some sort of a, uh, an elected official in the North, very astute, well-educated man, but he's listed in everything as, uh, and, and the pictures I have, he's just a giant. 
He was about 6'6 and 240 pounds, which is just a monstrous man at that time. Okay. So what they decide to do is they make a super bomb of the remaining sticks of dynamite. And Newt Lang, because he's much taller and lankier, um, they lay down some covering fire and he sprints towards the cabin and chucks it on the roof like a football. And kaboom, it goes off. It seems to have blown the roof in. Okay. Um, so then they decide they're going, and um, I believe like right after this happened, they're going to storm the cabin. They expect to find him dead, um, but they're cautious. This is where we once again get into different people describing things in a different manner. Um, they shine a flashlight. They have some kind of flashlight. They shine the flashlight in there and one of the books that i read said the flashlight lights up albert johnson um completely unharmed shooting at them with a pair of automatic revolvers okay well, you and i know that you know either a firearm is a semi-automatic or it's a revolver yeah and the flashlight one of the one of the books State the flashlight. Well, many of the books state the flashlight is shot out of the person's hand. Well, once again, um, so the some of the, the the more recent and better books articulate in more detail from the RCMP notes. There was no flashlight in anybody's hand. Um, the the team the team members were were cautious enough. They put a flashlight on a stick. Right. And shoved it out in front of the door and it got shot out. Okay. So he's, he's still there. He's still alive and he's still fighting. Still there. He's still alive. And what he's shooting with is the sawed off 16 gauge Ivor Johnson shotgun and the sawed off 22. So once again, um, you're getting a lot of the people writing about this, um, you know, um, Kind of, kind of ramping up Albert Johnson to be a 007 uh, with superhuman ability um, to, you know, shoot the flashlight out of someone's hand. Where, <laughs> yeah. which is, which is a stupid waste of ammunition. He should be shooting the guy holding the flashlight. <laughs> well, but, but you, you and I both know that, you know, um, you know, if he he, he touches off uh, around. From the from the 16 gauge shotgun, the pellets are flying all over the place, and it's not it's not that difficult to hit a hit a hit a light. He's shooting at the light and the and the yeah. you know, like However, the team members go, uh, "This is not good." They back out, back away. This is where the North starts to take its toll on everybody. They've been there for some time. They're Freeze, you know, the, the different team members are really suffering from the cold. They're running out of food for the dogs. They're running out of food for themselves. They determine they're going to head back. So they go back to Aklavik to, uh, or do they go to Fort McPherson to... to uh... Here, here's an, an hour later, recognizing that resources were completely spent, they begin the long, difficult trek back to Aklavik. So Inspector Eames radios a message to Constable Millen at the Red River Detachment, instructing him and Carl Gardland, uh, a trapper, um, to, on January 9th, check on the ruins of John's cabin, Johnson's cabin and report on what they found. Saturday, January 16th, Millen and Gardland found the ruins of the cabin destroyed, or, sorry, uh, deserted. So now they know they have to look for him. Uh, they mention as well, and this is mentioned a number of times, every time they think they're ahead, they get a heavy snow and they lose any tracks. So they're tracking him. He's left now? Yep, he's, go he's, he's left. And um, they don't know exactly uh, where he is. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of times they're, and, but they're, I mean, they're out looking for him, um, but they talk about, you know, not being able to see uh, or find tracks in the snow. So we're getting all the way into January 18th, January 22nd. They still have not found him um, and they're still searching. January 25th, uh, they spot tracks and, and um, 
this is one of the things that's mentioned consistently, and I think it's believable. Uh, most people at that time uh, in the North made their own snowshoes. And the different uh, trappers and other people in the North could tell each other by their snowshoes. And so his snowshoes were distinctive enough that they determined, yes, this is him. The worst news ever, uh, as, it's, as it's written anyway, he's headed for the Richardson Mountain. It's written a number of times, Richard, and feel free to jump in here, that over the, is over the Richardson Mountains into Alaska? Yeah, that, 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 it's the, the, the division there. I mean, it's not right there, but it's, it, it's close. They're very small mountains. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> but as you and I were talking just before we got going here, Rich, as you and I were talking, that's not the way it's written. Um, the way it's written in a number of publications, even the ones that are that try to be very astute and close to the facts, um, state that it was believed that neither man nor beast could could cross the Richardson Mountains in winter. Well, I mean, we were, of course, on modern snowmobiles and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, there was, you know, it, it was possible for uh, the fellows that I was with to to shoot from the, the river bottom that we were on to, to shoot to the top of the mountain. You right. know, like they, they, they weren't that that tall. Because I, I remember the stories that I heard about him was that he'd put on his snowshoes backwards and went up over this pass and right. and and then. Uh, so they they thought he was going the other way than from what he actually was, but the and I thought, oh my God, what a tough guy! Because I mean, if if you've ever put on snowshoes and tried to climb, I yeah. mean, it's it it's like the definition of insanity, mm -hmm. and and especially the, the the type of snowshoes they had back then. Those, those snowshoes weighed a lot. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, they were they were rawhide and willow and 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 that kind of stuff, and they they weighed a ton, and and they were big. You know, they they, they weren't uh, these short light. Uh, snowshoes that we, we use today but once i got up there and you know actually seen them i mean if you had no other mountains to compare it to that yeah okay they they, they would be uh you know awe-inspiring but i mean i live in the rockies or you know and and uh, you know we hunt sheep in the rockies net and i mean we change a lot more altitude up there than, than than they do than they have in the Richardsons, right? And I'm I'm not not to say that there aren't places in the Richardsons that are that are uh, you know uh, serious mountains, just mm -hmm. not what what we travel along. We travel alongside them all the way down from Aklavik all the way down to to uh, you know, Rat River, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they weren't they weren't that big. They're pretty, very pretty, but. Uh, you know, up there, most everything is burnt mm -hmm. in recent memory, and and so I mean everything's dead, dead trees, and and uh, you know in the winter time you're looking around, and and I mean everything's firewood, and mm -hmm. none of none of it's very tall. You know, it mm -hmm. might have a, a you know a, an eight or ten or twelve inch base on it, but but you know be sixteen, seventeen feet tall. That's it. That's it, right? You know, mm -hmm. and it'll have been killed by by fire. But no, they're they're not large mountains like when, when you think about you know trying to cross the the great divide from alberta into bc or something like that you know you know there are places where it's easy to here you know here, here in the, here in the rockies and uh so i don't know where he did it there but i remember thinking as we were traveling alongside is that you know you everybody has this vision in their head what a mountain is right All right and it's kind of like when you know when you stick your finger into the water, you know, is it warm? Is it cold? You know, how warm, how cold? I mean, it's kind of a, an interpretation thing, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, I was like, well, they ain't that big. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, th so this, this is an important point that, uh, well, absolutely. It was, in, it was, it was challenging for Albert Johnson um, and, and more, and, and, and more important, uh, all of the, police and civilians that were trying to follow him. Um, but I guess what I'm getting at is this, is this is where we get into people very much trying to dramatize um, things slightly more than they are. Um, um, or uh, in, in the, in, you know, in, in, the uh, in, in the view of somebody who isn't an outdoorsman or like yourself has hasn't seen these mountains well then you can describe it however you want to describe it and it, it'll be mount killer you know it'll be it'll be the, the tallest mountains in the world 
the one thing that would be absolutely awe-inspiring is the winter. You know, and and back in the thirties, I mean, it would it, they they had cold winters. They had they had lots of snow. You're in the uh, Arctic Ocean influence there, so I mean, if it warms up to uh, minus twenty, the wind blows. That's a Chinook there, and it blows and blows and blows, and and those that 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 all creates its its own uh, own set of problems. I was more impressed that they were living there in the winter, right, than, than the mountain part. Yeah. Well, and, and, and just, just kind of going over a couple of the different books that I have here, uh, Richard, they, uh, they, they mention, uh, and, and it's written uh, quite often, the temperature was minus 50. Well, I don't think they meant minus 50 Celsius. I think they mean 50 below. Well, minus 50 Celsius would, would be worse than 50 below. Okay. At 40, 40 they're both equal. Yeah. And after that, then then Celsius is colder. <laughs> it, it's, it's just written minus forty five, minus fifty. Uh, yep. One of the one of one of the uh, one of the RCMP members wrote, "Well, at fifty below, I was damn chilly." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, everybody says once it gets to forty below, it never gets any colder. Has never been any colder. <laughs> so Thursday, January twenty eighth, nineteen thirty two. One of the native tracking guides, or here's the news from somebody else, or here's it that near the Bear River, there was two shots made by nobody that they knew. So they believe it's it's Albert Johnson hunting for food. Uh, fi- Friday, January 29th, 1932, get on his trail. And that's when they believe Albert Johnson becomes aware that they're, they're tracking him. And that's when he starts doing the unbelievable things, uh, putting the snowshoes on backwards. You have to read a bunch of these, a bunch of these different books very carefully. And this, this is also partly where the bit of the the madman. There were times when he was laying down double the amount of false track as he was uh, making distance. If you get what I mean. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, he would also get on the trail of caribou herds, take his snowshoes off so that, you know, he, he and he would walk in there in, in their hoof prints to try to uh, hide his track. And again, you know, putting the snowshoes on backwards, laying the false trails. And, and that was kind of baffling because they, they knew at times that uh, he could cover incredible distances on, on snowshoes. Um, and might have outdistanced them, you know, and there were time, and at times the, the different team members split up and decided to follow different trails and would come around some, uh, a bend, just like what you're describing in that area, uh, both tracking Johnson and they come around a bend and there they are facing one another. <laughs> he was, uh, he was a tough man and he, and he was, he, he was, uh, tough. very accomplished tough. in the, in, in the, uh, in the wilderness. How long did they chase him before they discovered they were getting nowhere. Mentions that late January, January 25th, 28th, 29th in there, they're getting nowhere. Uh, on January 30th, they, for lack of a better reason, a better explanation, they corner him. They kind of, uh, they kind of catch him in a prairies here. We would call it a bluff. <laughs> I guess okay. there would be, it would be almost like a canyon, which fortunately for Albert Johnson, Unfortunately for uh, Edgar Millen, the area where Johnson was in was one of those areas with a lot of blowdown, a lot of blowdown trees to yeah. hide behind. Hard to see. They knew he was in there. They could hear him coughing. That's how close he was. And they go in and again try to order him out. A shootout ensues. Hey, Rich here. Sandy and I are pleased at the rapid growth of our exclusive community. Trapping Inc. at Locals.com. We created the community to connect more closely with our fans, friends, and supporters without the interference and censorship of social media companies. Because this community is subscriber exclusive, there is no censored photos, shadow banning, and deplatforming 
This happens on Twitter and Facebook. Trolls are non-existent, as not a one will spend a nickel and put their money where their mouth is to protest on a paid site. You know it. We are steadily moving all Trapping Inc., YouTube videos, and podcasts as quickly as time and bandwidth allow. We're tickled and surprised to see how large of library we must move. As well, we are sharing articles on trapping and guns and shooting. Our new TV series, Married to the Hunt, videos are here too. Hours and hours of never before released to the internet hunting and fishing from around the world. Trappinginc.locals.com will be the exclusive home of all Trapping Inc. content from the past and into the future. What else is there to do? Well, there's a forum for everyone to post pictures on and interact. You can message us directly on trappinginc.locals.com as well as interact with all the other subscribers. These are all people with common interests. Get in here. This whole venture is about taking the Trapping Inc. TV community to the next level, building a community of shared interest and interacting with all of our friends. Who knows where we can go from here? Just go to locals.com and sign up for a free account. Then search for Trapping Inc. and subscribe for $5 a month. That's it. Go to locals.com to open a free account and then subscribe for $5 a month to Trapping Inc. Help us spread the truth about a way of life and the responsible, ethical management of the wild resources. Trappinginc.locals.com. Now back to the show. Uh, one of the trappers is, is, quite, is, is quite close, and Constable Millen uh, fires, I believe, two shots, and uh, it's commented that the trap, uh, Albert Johnson, seemed to mark where, exactly where the shots were coming, and shot Constable Millen right through the heart. Okay, so he killed Millen. Yeah, Special Constable Garland, I believe he's uh, one of the trappers, um, reaches out and gets a hold of uh, Constable Edgar Millen's boot laces and uses that to drag uh, Millen uh, out, but it's too late. And once again, Albert Johnson gets away. Now they 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 regroup. They they take the the body back. Right. They they build a platform um, to keep Millen's body up away from um, any, any scavenging animals. I don't believe everybody left, but they headed out to Aklavik to advise Inspector Ames about what was the latest thing that's happened. Ames then Inspector Ames makes some fairly radical decisions uh, for the time. But they were astute decisions in that he calls uh, for an airplane. Okay, and so how was the airplane used? So the airplane. So this, this had never been this had never been done before. Um, but the fortunate thing that ha- that um, that had occurred years before was World War One. So uh, people now knew if you really want to be able to be effective on the ground, um, the most ideal thing is to have a radio on the ground, which they had as a result of Signal Corps men, uh, Hersey and Riddell. Right. And so they call for uh, an aircraft and they get uh, a World War I flying ace uh, WAP made. And right. a, uh, the Blanca uh, aircraft. Now the thing about that is, so this is this is this is a huge advantage. However, um, it's it's you know in the in the in the days as we're getting into February here, it indi- the it indicates a number of times. However, the aircraft is grounded because yes. of storms, heavy snow, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I can believe that. Yeah. So. Um, because of the difficulty of flying in those days, Wap May flew with a full-time mechanic, Jack Bowen, who flew with the aircraft all the time just to keep it going. It's amazing, and and when you think about the the fact that they were, you know, they were uh, talking over a radio, that they were, you know, communicating through a radio, and that, and what they had for batteries back then. Oh, like yeah. it was, it was bloody amazing that 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 it did anything in in that weather and 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 that time, you know. Well, and and, and there's and there's and there's notes that at times um, the radio was ineffective because of the cold. Yeah, uh, you know, it was just it was just uh, um, too difficult. Basically, the search goes on where it would appear that he uh, is the Eagle River 
on the other side of the Richardson Mountains? It would be on the Yukon side. Okay. Yeah. Well, because he makes it over the Richardson Mountains. Yep. Okay. And um, um, they're searching, they're trailing him. And uh, once again, it's the same, it's the same detail with deal with him laying. Um, and, and there's, there's some comments uh, in some of the different publications, which I believe um, uh, are true in that um, as much as Johnson was very smart in laying the false trails and doubling back and turning the people in circles towards the end, that's what hurt him. Okay. Yeah, they believe that uh, when he put, when he was persisted persisted in doing this uh, towards the end, especially once they had the aircraft, they believe at times he might have been able to outdistance them when they would lose his track. But he was fixated on um, on laying these false tracks and doubling back and confusing the search team, and then um, finally uh, they end up. Um, on the Eagle River. All right, but they the, the because the plane was an advantage that he wasn't used to. Right. It could travel so much faster. It could cover the area. It could find him quickly. Right. And and, and he was wasting the time trying to trying to hide from somebody on the ground. He wasn't thinking three dimensionally. Right. Well, the other the other thing that's that's mentioned is so I just I just checked this one book. Um, the aircraft was not originally necessarily supposed to be for spotting Johnson from the aircraft, but more crucial dropping supplies right. for the team so that they could stay out there. Because as, as you can imagine, <laughs> the dogs need a lot of food and, and, the, and the, uh, the, the search party members as well. Uh, so the, the, uh, the, that was, that was part of it. It's amazing that the plane would carry enough to be wor worthwhile. I mean, it's it's already got two people in it. They're not, they're, yeah. It wasn't like there were giant planes back then. It just it seems it seems amazing, and and they would fly back and forth from from uh, McPherson or a Clavick or 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 whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So they catch up with them then on on the uh, Eagle River. They catch up with them on the Eagle River. Says here, February seventeenth, nineteen thirty-two. They are uh, on the Eagle River, and uh, I've you know, some of the diagrams uh, that I've seen shows the Eagle River exact as you and I discussed it. It's one of those rivers that twists back on itself. Uh, yeah, constantly. you got to understand that country up there is. You know how how you have a how a creek meanders on on the prairie. Because there's not a lot of change in elevation, that's right. not up there. It's just it's just it's Muskeg and 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 mountains and that. There's not a lot of change in elevation, so things just meander back and forth and on top of themselves and away they go. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 crazy when you think about it. Because I mean, to apply what you know about a, a creek in the in your backyard in Saskatchewan, right? For it to be up there on a river up there, which is moving a vast amount of water, but it's the mm -hmm. same meandering you know because there's not a lot of change in elevation there's it's not like it's all gorges and and uh you know river flying right they're on his trail and they note that he's taken off his snowshoes and he's walking on the river uh there's some notes uh as well too from uh that he doesn't seem to be um taking the same kind of strides as he was before He's, he seems to be you know, walking a little bit erratically. He's not quite putting the miles on them anymore. They believe the finale of how this happens is because, um, as you can well imagine, the dogs are barking, making noise, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Johnson knows that they're close. And they discover later that what he was doing is climbing up on the bank um, and climbing trees. <laughs> to be, yeah, to be able to look back and see where they were, okay? But because of the way that river uh, twists and turns uh, at the final end there, they believe that as Johnson was looking back, um, um, you know, climbing, tree, you know, just trying to get some elevation to, to be able to see where the, where the posse was, um, he misjudged 
um, how you know because the river almost doubled back on itself. He right. Was, judge which way the posse was coming because the posse comes around the bend and there's Albert Johnson coming right towards them. Okay. At around 300 yards. Okay. Now, um, there's at least three dog teams. The, the guy that's in the lead, Royal Canadian Signal Corps Sergeant Hersey. And I think, I think they know he was a former Olympic athlete and also had the fastest dog team, something he was very proud of. So he, so he's out uh, ahead of everybody else. Who knows whether he calls out to Johnson to surrender, but anyway, he stops his dogs, drops to one knee, and starts shooting. Does he hit Johnson? Uh, not right away. Uh, Johnson is shooting back, and the other, the other uh, team members pull up. Most notably is... Uh, Hersey is hit. Albert Johnson figured out, who knows, figured out the range or whatever, and um, shot Hersey. Uh, different accounts that I've read, he was kneeling, as you can imagine, kneeling and, and shooting off one knee, and the bullet hit him kind of through that knee, through the elbow, and right into the chest. Wow. Fortunately for him, the other... Um, team members are spreading out. They're also climbing up on the riverbanks. And uh, Albert Johnson realizes this. Um, and he also drops his snowshoes and tries to climb the riverbank as well to get up into the tree. Somebody, I, I'm, they're not entirely sure, they believe uh, it may have been, um, again, the military member Riddell, uh, Albert Johnson, uh, as he's trying to climb the river riverbank, somebody uh, a, a shot lands that instantly disables Albert Johnson. Uh, he drops, and he can't he can't walk or move or run, but he rolls over, lays down his his backpack, and keeps shooting. Um, that may have even been at the time that he hit Hersey. I'm not sure the exact. What was later discovered is Johnson was carrying a box of uh, 22 ammo in his hip pocket. And one of the bullets hit that uh, box of ammo and grenaded it and blew his one hip out. Oh, my God. So he drops down and he continues shooting. And um, they, most of the accounts credit as the team members are spreading out um, uh, Riddell is up on the bank and uh, gets busy with his Lee Enfield and at one of his shots the trapper just goes still and that's it. So they believe that was, it was him that fired the, uh, the killing shot. So th this, uh, this all, you know, from the time Hersey is hit uh, to the time Albert Johnson is killed is, is minutes, if that. Okay. Because within a few more minutes uh, Wap May flies over, uh, and, and, and Wap May is up above circling and taking pictures. Uh, no way. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, ha I have the, the pictures. So we, we had the, we had the first episode of cops happening. <laughs> yeah. Now the thing about the pictures is they're just dots, uh, Rich, like, you know, even though there's, there's, there's arrows pointing, you can, you can see yeah. that. Yep. all you see is dots yep. you know you know the valiant effort but anyway um so then they they, they indicate uh what may that kind of uh flies lower over the trapper and then waggles the wings on to to signal to the uh to the crew yeah he's dead uh and then swoops down and lands and picks up hersey and straight to aklavik for surgery and so in in wrapping it all up, like, what was wrong with the guy? Like, why 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 was you know? Did anybody ever find out where his money came from? Or what why he uh, you know did he cause trouble up there? I mean, um, it's it's no, no one no one part of that. Those theories just go on and on and on forever. Um, you uh, some some of the mysteries are very much uh, unraveled. When uh, in 2007, the uh, 
uh, the History Channel uh, exhumes his body. Okay. You have time to go into that? We got, uh, oh my God, we're, we're, we're running on to just about pushing two hours here. Let's, 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 let's do the Cliff's, Cliff's Coles notes here, man. Okay. In 2007, uh, the History Channel zooms his body. Yeah. Okay. And um, there's, there's a lot of, you know, they, they assemble just a dream team of scientists, uh, archaeologists, forensic dentologists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they discover a number of different things, uh, although not exactly, you know, what, uh, uh, what you would want to find out. But one of the things I just wanted to mention is that, so there was a zillion theories over the n decades since he was killed as to who he was, because nobody really, there was no indication. He did have on his person, Rich, around $2,400. Okay, a lot of money then. Is 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 an astounding amount of money for that time. Right. Uh, there's, I'll just jump ahead a little bit. There's a retired RCMP member, uh, Jerry Rogers, who is now handling the DNA from that. And when he and I discussed this, uh, he said, you know, the twenty four hundred dollars at that point in time is literally like carrying around thirty to forty thousand dollars on your person now. The other thing that was indicated in all the books I ever read, including as a kid, Rich, one of the the items that was found on him was a little jar of gold teeth. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. either a grave robber or there was some dead people missing twenty four hundred bucks <laughs> and teeth. Well and, and and so there's there's a number of the different books that were written, Rich, that that suggested that what he was doing is preying on on remote trappers and killing them and pulling the gold teeth. Okay. Um, I mean, it's 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 just a crazy, unusual thing to have um, amongst your different possessions is is a, a jar uh, with gold teeth in it. Does the DNA tell us where he came from? Who he was? Yes and no. Um, the first uh, the, uh, part of the reason they did this is because. Over the years, a number of different people had come forward, um, um, particularly from North Dakota, um, because he was noted or believed to be Swedish or Norwegian uh, in, in, in ancestry. There were uh, two or three families from, um, from the Dakotas that believed there was, uh, there was uh, a fellow named Johnny Johnson, uh, another one named Fremerlid, uh, another one named Sigvald, and the families genuinely believed this was their missing great uncle, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So this was part of the reason for the body. So they unearthed the body, and um, they discover a number of things. Um, one of the first things they discover is that um, the, 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 uh, Albert Johnson walked with a slight stoop and this was believed, you know, like a lot of, you know, guys that lived that life, it was from a lifetime of hard work. Well, when they examined his skeleton, they found no, none of those kind of indications that would be, um, likely, um, what he did have is uh, a spinal abnormality in his, in his lower spine. Um, but not that would, you know, impair him. Um, he also had an abnormality with one foot, um, but he was in phenomenal physical condition. Um, the gold teeth, they were his. Really? Yes. Yes. What's fascinating now, I, I'll just, uh, just for those that are listening, I highly recommend there's a book called The Mad Trapper Unearthing a Mystery by Barbara Smith. And in my opinion, that is the bat because this is basically the companion book. I believe online you can find the documentary that was made by the History Channel of the exhuming the body, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the thing that was that was astounding to everyone is uh, in his mouth was some of the most expensive and intricate gold dental work um, that was ever seen for that that part that point in time 
And so the the teeth that he had in on his body were what ones he pulled out, or they were his. They were falling out because he was starving to death, running from the monkeys. Oh, I got you. I got you. I got you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah. was he just a miserable person, or was he pulling well, in Napoleon Bonaparte and lead was killing him, or turning him crazy, or um, most likely? Um, and I'll just since you want to kind of wrap up, uh, I had a long chat with uh, with uh, Jerry Rogers that uh, his site is called Dying Words. So um, what happened is all of, the, all of the individuals, all the family members that had come forward, and there were some Canadians from Ontario as well that came forward and they tried to do a DNA match, no match. Okay. No match to anybody. Um, but um, so then the, as you can imagine, you know, the certain people have paid for all of this. So, and there's other projects to go on. So who on earth is going to be the point man to carry this forward? And uh, Jerry Rogers became uh, involved because of his background, forensic background in the RCMP. And he was also a chief coroner in British Columbia. Okay. So basically what he's doing now is he's the point man for people to come forward and say, hey, this is, this is what we think. This is why we think this is one of our relatives. And, you know, can you do a DNA match? Getting back to your question, who was he? Uh, we had a, Rogers and I had a long discussion on that. There's so many different theories. Is he a remittance man? Um, I'm pretty sure one of the theories is that he was a foreign spy is, is most likely not true. Uh, between Jerry and I, we believe he, uh, it would, the gold teeth indicates that at one time he was a very well-to-do individual. Right. Right. Very well-to-do. And probably, um, and we, I mean, I mean, I know a lot of times that dental work can identify where a person comes from. You know, well, and, and I'm so, sure so they've looked sure, at sure, and and so to that end, uh, what they did in the in the in the what the History Channel did with their experts is they determined from his teeth. Of course, um, um, when you get your permanent teeth, um, you know that uh, you you that indicates where you grew up, how you grew up, right? And the thing that's a very of significant note with the Rat River Trapper is he grew up with a very heavy corn diet. Okay. A very heavy corn diet. And because uh, his remains, the fingernails were still intact uh, because of the permafrost where he was buried in Aklavik. And, and his burial is another, is another bit of some weird, interesting stuff if you want to discuss it. Uh, yeah, the, the, his, he was not buried in a coffin. It was just, it was just a box that he was jammed into because nobody would build the coffin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and his leg bones, his lower leg bones were broken because his body was frozen. And so the, the uh, laborer that built the box built it slightly too short. And so they, they, they jumped on his legs to break his legs to stuff them into this box. Yeah. Uh, and and he was not buried in a regular cemetery because the folks in Aklavik would have none of it. Oh, that's Catholic there. I mean, very yep. very strong Catholic church. So he would yep. not be yep. uh, buried in sacred ground by any means. Yeah. Anyway, and uh, so so yeah. So according to uh, I think the term was used as isotopes, which is yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, they he grew up in a much milder climate than Canada. So okay. they're thinking either either Norway or Sweden um, or United States. Who was he? Um, this is this is my personal belief and something that I've discussed with with Gary. We're thinking American bank robber. Really, that's that's what we're thinking, and and it may be wrong. It may be wrong, but part of the discussion is just in in my law enforcement career which was not that spectacular but just what i know there's a lot of people that are bold enough to take a shot at the police 
there's almost nobody in history that will stand and keep shooting when the police are shooting back. This well, is, yeah, I mean, through this before, different time and place that was. I mean, those people today, all of a sudden, a gun goes off, pointed back at you. That's that's a big deal. It wasn't so big a deal back in in those days, but I I could see him being on the run. Mm -hmm. That he had committed something, and when the when the cops showed up, he thought he was they were coming for him for that. That would mm -hmm. make sense. I mean, other than you know he'd went crazy or whatever, but right. I could see him that being the motivation for 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 shooting at them the, the very first time they came knocking, right? But it's 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 one of those it's one of those things, I guess you know, kind of in summary, the the tragedy of all of the things that have been written about about uh, Albert Johnson or whomever he was. Um, is, you know, the contributions of, of the First Nations trackers, uh, the, the trappers that assisted uh, the RCMP uh, members. Um, and, and the big thing, this guy wasn't a trapper. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> back, know, back to what, what got under your, your, your skin to begin with. He was well, not a trapper and he was, he was giving trappers a bad name. Well, and, and I, have, I have one of, one of the notes right from 1931 when this because this hit the media because remember also in 1931 we have the big thing radio so there's radio broadcasts and you know as as the manhunt wears on and there's no new news um well then they kind of start trying to to fill things and um already this is being pitched as a trapper who has gone bushed or gone crazy from being alone too long. Yeah. And the thing that bugs me about that is when you read, um, and, and, and just, and just like, just like the old fellow you interviewed, uh, and all of and Karras and Gene Walters, the big thing that they talked about when they were out trapping, not only was there, there weren't enough hours in the day, there weren't enough minutes in the day. You were busy all the time. You know, so yep. it's not like you were sitting there brooding away um, with nothing to do. You you maybe got lonely, but you were you were there for a lawful occupation, and trappers were very social, very productive people. And you know, my beef is it it it's been a negative association <laughs> to from way back. Well, you've had your chance to to set the record straight. Okay. Uh, where can people uh, reach you? Where, where's give us your your, your uh, website for your your um, knives? Oh, sure. It's it's uh, trapspringknives.com. Okay, and Joel makes some pretty cool knives. I've got one of them. Uh, yeah. It it has been a pleasure, Joe. And I, uh, I, I one, one more thing, Rich. If there are if there are people that believe they have a family uh, connection. Um, the, again, the, the process for a DNA match is still underway. Jerry Rogers' site is dyingwords.net. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Maybe, maybe we'll find out who this guy is eventually. Well, in, and Jerry and I discussed that this is probably the only way to find out truly who he was, because otherwise we're, we're grasping at straws um even even the american bank robber thing it, it's it's just a theory it's just a theory based on the bits and pieces that we have um but um there you go well oh, perfect thank you for taking the time and i hope everybody enjoyed uh learning about uh, the mad trapper who wasn't actually a trapper but the madman of rat river and <laughs> yeah, yeah. and and the, the first time that, that anybody used uh, uh, air support and a radio in tracking down a fugitive, that's pretty cool. And have in the far north, not even in some easy place in the far north. Yeah. Anyway, everybody take care and thank you, Joe. All right, thank you.